So basically we are doing research in two big projects in the Caribbean. Uh, one is the Nexus project, which was the biggest project which also funded the first research. And then we are part of a second project, um, the SEBA project, which is an acronym for Stone Interchanges within the Bohemian Archipelago. But it's funny because this is also, uh, SIBA is also the term for stone in the classic Taino uh, dialect, so that fits uh, pretty well. And this study explores the Bohemian Archipelago's position within and connections to the wider Caribbean uh, region. And this study showcases how museum collections of Lucane materials, many which were accessioned in the early 1900s, uh, were not studied for over a century, can contribute enormously to expand our understanding of Lucane exchange networks and connections to the wider Circum Caribbean uh, region. So over 700 islands make up the Bahamas and uh, Turks and Caicos, uh, which is called the Lucane Archipelago, and uh, the southern islands are comprising, are comprising the Turks and Caicos Islands and the Inaguas, and those are some 100 miles north of the nearest Great Antilles Islands of uh, Hispaniola and uh, Cuba. Uh, which are the proposed homelands of the initial settlers, settlers of this uh, archipelago. And uh, forays into the Turks and Caicos were initiated approximately, um, also Sebastian pointed that out, uh, 700 AD, with expansions from northern Hispaniola, uh, primarily to exploit key marine uh, resources. And uh, the Bahamas were colonized roughly at the same time by migrants from north and central Cuba and also probably Hispaniola. And the current evidence suggests um, that the first um, settlers used these islands as seasonal uh, outposts, but it was not until after approximately 1000 AD that permanent uh, settlements, I think you said something like 800 AD, that permanent settlements were established on the main islands and populations increased and material culture diversified. So within this short time frame, people migrated from the much larger islands of Cuba and uh, Hispaniola and adapted to the smaller, newly colonized settings while they are retaining certain traditions of their homelands, as well as maintaining wider links to facilitate access to um, desirable, which are not available locally, as for the jade, for example. So um, what you can see here is a really simplified geological map of the um, Greater Caribbean. And uh, it is clear that the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos Islands um, are entirely formed out of limestone. And limestone is just too soft for making useful tools. So therefore all hard rocks like uh, jade, uh, chert and basalts, which are necessary for food and plant processing had to be important, imported. And our objective is to determine the source of these exotics. Um, this study is also quite unique because it is a synergy and it's a combination uh, which pitches the arts and the scientists, sciences. And we are all, um, we are different researchers um, with specialities in petrology and iconography and geochemistry. Uh, and we are using state-of-the-art isotope geochemical studies and we are aiming to explore the wider social, political, and economic connections between the archipelago and the wider Caribbean setting. Uh, what is also quite unique is that uh, SIVA brings together close to 300 lithic artifacts, uh, which are held in eight international museums, and this is the largest corpus of Lucane lithic artifacts that was yet assembled in one project. And uh, these artifacts are really underutilized. Even so, they provide um, potentially highly um, uh, potential information. Um, but um, over the last decade, there has an explosion of research interest in the movement of materials, peoples and animals within and beyond the Caribbean using groundbreaking scientific techniques but the Bahamas have been remained largely peripheral to this um, emergent picture of such dynamic network. 
um, despite the great potential these collections are um, holding. And this is mainly due to the fact um, that many of the more elaborated the artifacts, which you can see uh, behind me, uh, were acquired outside a controlled uh, archaeological context. So that they, that's why they have been basically forgotten. Um, they mostly entered the museum collections in the 19th century or early 20th century, um, and they are perceived as lacking provenance. Uh, even so, many are having clear associated uh, information. Um, the National Museum of the American Indian and the National Museum of Natural History in uh, Washington, the Smithsonian Museums, hold roughly half of the relevant collection for the CBA study. Um, in total, 117 underwent initial review by Portable XRF, and approximately 60 are included in the laser ablation analysis, um, which will then determine the isotope composition and the trace elements. But we also have, uh, we also sampled artifacts from the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Cuba, and uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, 38 of those are shortlisted for laser ablation. Um, and even so, the project focuses on the Bahamas. An understanding of the source material is required to better discern the position of the Lucane archipelago in the network spanning the wider Caribbean reason, region. Um, and hence the inclusion of those comparative materials um, from larger southern islands is uh, quite crucial. Um, these selected lithic artifacts, many of which have been in the collection since the turn of the century, have not been part of any previous study. But they offer a unique opportunity to study artifacts that are now rarely encountered in the archaeological record. And in the Bahamas, such artifacts were mainly deposited in caves, and these were largely cleared for the guano-rich soils in the 19th centuries. Um, and then the artifacts are often dispersed locally. So museum collections are therefore an integral component when looking at the wider archaeological context for these islands. Without them, we lose the connection to a large and important body of material that had clear value and meaning. Um, this is one of our first results. So what you see here is basically the distribution of lithic materials by islands uh, in the Smithsonian uh, collections. The green is indicating um, jade artifacts, omphacite and jadeite artifacts, uh, the brown color, other lithologies. Um, and the size, of course, is indicating the amount of uh, material um, that was um, found in the collection. And was, what was really astonishing for us is that uh, quite a big percentage of the artifacts uh, which are in those collections are actually made out of jade. Um, what was also interesting for us to see is that many of those artifacts were wrongly classified, classified as serpentinite. So uh, we basically had a closer look and we could give new information about the lithology of those uh, artifacts. So for us, it's really important to know how do these objects um, reflect the connections to uh, other islands. And do they support the current hypothesized links based largely on diagnostic imported ceramics? Or do they connect in any unexpected ways, potentially even to the mainland? So our ongoing research will hopefully uh, clarify this. So by geochemically fingerprinting those artifacts and comparing them to the database which I presented um, two talks before, uh, we will contribute to basically better understand um, how these former societies interacted with each other and were organized and operated. But the problem is often that public and private institutions do not allow us to um, sample those artifacts. Uh, Non-destructive uh, analysis is a bad, bad word when you talk to uh, curators and uh, restorators. Even so, we can gain so much more information out of um, destructive analysis. Then another, 
yeah, sorry, I have to say that. Um, uh, then another thing is uh, most of the time artifacts are not allowed to be transported. So therefore what we really need is an instrument that allows us to sample those, um, um, those artifacts basically macroscopically um, non-invasive and which is trans, um, transportable. So if we look at commercial available portable analytical techniques like portable XRF, which is non-destructive or portable uh, laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, which is minimal invasive. There are several limitations. So first of all, we need a calibration with matrix max uh, standards. Then we cannot detect any isotope um, compositions and we do not get the full range of uh, trace elements. So often those methods are not suited enough or sufficient enough to discriminate between different uh, geological sources of raw materials. So um, what we also saw normally uh, the best is um, to um, resolve the provenance of those geological materials is a combination of elemental abundances and sometimes isotope compositions, which might help. For example, the strontium ratio we could use uh, for Cuba, we saw that was quite helpful. So that is why I would like to present this new method that we are using. What you see here is the portable, um, the assembled portable laser ablation device, which consists of an air-cold uh, dyed uh, pumped solid state laser operating in the green light, 532 nanometers. The laser light is coupled into an optical fiber and is then leading the laser light into this uh, laser ablation module. There the um, light is basically uh, reflected uh, by a mirror and then um, collimated and focused by two lenses on a sample surface. Then we are ablating the material and then by a suction of an ambient airstream, which is generated by a membrane pump, um, the material will be transported onto a sample holder and the sample holder has space for six filters and each uh, filter uh, represent basically one sample. And Casper um, already um, pointed that out. We might need more than one ablation because especially in jadeite, uh, neodymium is really low concentrated. Strontium is not such a big issue, but neodymium uh, is really a problem and let us even worse. So therefore, currently we need at least um, 20 ablations. But in my next slide, I will uh, show you that this damage is really neg neglectable. Uh, what I also would like to mention is that uh, we also have the chance to handhold um, this um, ablation module and then we are independent and we can sample basically everything uh, independent of size and shape. Um, so again, I really would like to emphasize that the damage that we are causing is neglectable and we are gaining so much more information out of this minimal destructive analysis. So we have our sample on those small filters and then we are taking those, uh, the filters back to our um, laboratories at the Freie Universität Amsterdam for further uh, geochemical analysis, trace element analysis and isotope composition analysis. Um, these are really tiny, tiny amounts of material. So per ablation pit, we are um, generating a, a crater uh, of approximately um, 100 to 130 micrometer in width and depth. But still, uh, uh, you see here, the damage is neglectable. You cannot really see those, those ablation pits with the naked eye. Normally what we are always aiming for is we are aiming for sampling in a broken surface. But even if we have a pristine object, most of the time there's a kind of label on one side. So then we stick to that side and this is not on exhibition. So, but even if you wouldn't see it. One problem we have to face uh, is a blank issue. Contamination is a big issue when you're dealing with such small sample sizes. So the whole methodology is designed to um, reduce and decrease the blank influence on all steps of uh, sampling process and analysis. And what you couldn't see here, what we are also having now is a kind of portable flow hood 
that's basically a box which we can put around um, the laser, which we didn't have when we visited Kaspar in um, Denmark at the National Museum. But uh, now we have this flow unit. Um, so basically we are pumping in um, ambient air. So there's a slight overpressure and this prevents uh, dust uh, to be sucked in while ablating. And this is dramatically increasing the sampling plank because the samples are processed in a clean laboratory and there the plank is low uh, anyhow, but the sampling was always a big issue. And um, using this mythology, the sampling mythology, we were able to convince a wide um, majority of conservators uh, and museum people to give us access to their uh, collections. Um, and they opened up their collections for us. And within the Nexus project, uh, we went to a private uh, collection on Grenada to sample uh, jade artifacts, uh, mainly from the Pearl site. We went to visit uh, Kaspar Tofgat at the National Museum in Copenhagen to sample artifacts from the Virgin Islands. A uh, very well-known site is Prosperity, which you already mentioned. Katharina Gutzufalki did a lot of work on, uh, on the pendants and beads. Uh, then, of course, um, on our own exhibition together with the Caribbean Research Group in Leiden, uh, we did a lot of analysis on things from the Museo del Hombre Dominicano, Museo Altos de Chavon in the Dominican Republic, from the Playa Grande site, which um, Sebastian Knippenberg talked about. It's a really important site. We also think it's really important for jade distribution. Um, then we also excavated uh, in the Monte Cristi area, um, the El Manantial site. It's also a very large site, probably also very important. And then uh, Gareth Davis, uh, he has a nice life actually, because he had certain <laughs> trips uh, to the Caribbean in the last two months. So he went to uh, Puerto Rico to visit some uh, samples and he's just back from uh, Barbados. And for, for the uh, CIVA project, uh, we had possibilities to sample really highly repetitive uh, collections at really, really nice museums. American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, where we also worked together with George Harlow and um, who also provided us with source rock samples from Guatemala. It's really hard to get the hands on those samples. Uh, Peabody Museum uh, of the University of Harvard, Peabody Museum, uh, University of Yale, both Smithsonian uh, Museums, um, National Museum of uh, Natural History in Washington, National Museum of American Indian, but we also made trips of course to the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos Islands to visit the museums uh, there. So you see um, those two studies combined together with the Sorkro stu uh, study spans really a lot of uh, artifacts. Um, these are just some pictures from our team uh, for our uh, trips. We had a lot of master students conducting their thesis within this project. They were all happy uh, going to the Bahamas, going to the US. And we are currently working uh, on those results. That's me sitting uh, in New York in the American Museum of Natural History. So, uh, to summarize the benefits of portable laser ablation sampling, we are avoiding the transport of the artifact. It's quasi non-destructive because by no chance you can see the ablation pits. Even if you look with the naked eye, you have to search um, actively with the lens. Um, then we are able to perform elemental and isotopic fingerprinting on ceramic, glass, pigments, metal and lithic artifacts. So we are not only um, reduced to one type of material. Now there's a new laser at Yale who's going to be uh, produced. He has a diff it has a different wavelength, uh, it has a UV wavelength, and this enables people there to um, ablate also translucent materials, something that is not um, possible with our laser. Um, we do not need calibration or mat matrix match standards uh, compared to portable XRF or portable LIPS. And the limits of detection are much lower uh, compared to uh, those two methods. I wanted to show you some provenance data. Uh, this is an ongoing process. Unfortunately, I was not able to do it. We are hard working on it. Um, but um, basically, preliminary results are showing that the Dominican Republic was an important source, but still we cannot rule out that even in late ceramic age, some artifacts may have come from Guatemala. 
And then I also would like to point out something uh, from colleagues' uh, recent research. So also you stated that there's a big uh, discrepancy and, um, how do you say, um, controversy going on between uh, researchers about uh, the occurrence of Jedi in early ceramic uh, site age, especially on uh, Hispaniola. We couldn't find any early ceramic uh, site ages. That is why people always say <coughs> Jedi comes later with late ceramic age um, sites. But we clearly have jades from early ceramic jade um, age sites from the Virgin Islands and also from Grenada. So this is going to be really interesting whether or not we can prove that there was actually jade um, uh, present. And then I also want to pinpoint towards a study conducted and published by Harlow now in 2019 on three cells from uh, San Salvador, Bahamas, where he also said, well, two axes really fit well to the signature of the Dominican Republic. But even so, he's not ruling out that there might be an unknown source and one fits very well to Cuba. So this is always what we have to keep in our minds that there are probably more unknown sources which are yet uh, need to be discovered. Thank you so much for your attention.